everything was going well until five, ten years later, there was no baby. I joined the infertility support group. Maybe here I would get help from those like me who understood my journey and my struggles. Here I had the good, the bad, and the ugly. One woman told how after a lengthy adoption process, she was told that, sorry, adoption is not for singles, yet she had been divorced due to infertility. I wondered why she didn't go to another country where laws allowed adoption for singles. Another woman talked of how she sought IVF and she was told that it would cost her $10,000. At less than a dollar a day, it would take 30 years of her to afford it. Is that the value of a baby? A third woman tearfully narrated how a gestational carrier implanted with her embryo changed her mind, refused to surrender the baby, and disappeared into the slums with her $5,000 and her baby. And then I wondered, who actually owned that baby? The most hilarious, yet so tragic, was one who narrated how a 48-hour power failure in the biobank destroyed her precious embryos and down the drain when the embryos, her savings, and her motherhood dreams. I wondered, who should she, she sue, the bank or the electricity company? Then there was this lady who explained how she bought a baby. Yes, bought. For $1,000, there was a clinic where single pregnant girls gave up their babies, and the clinic organized that a birth notification came up in her name. And then she said how she was arrested, charged, and imprisoned for baby theft. It's caring to think that mother, motherhood could leave one in prison. The solution was simple, another said. She allowed her husband to get another wife, who went on to have 10 children. Later, paternity tests showed that none were sired by her husband. Why did I think of this? And then there's this woman who said, forget conventional medicine or illegal deals. Go straight for traditional surrogacy. She told of how she had resorted to a traditionally acceptable arrangement, and now she was a female husband, happily married to a woman whose children were now hers. Initially, I thought it was lesbianism, but no. This was the first time I had a woman marrying another woman achieving motherhood, or was it fatherhood? I'm talking about ethics of infertility solutions. I'm talking about commercialization and commodification of reproduction. I'm talking about accountability in access to infertility treatment. For most people, the challenge is birth control. But for some, infertility is real. Infertility statistics tell us that about 12% globally is the prevalence of infertility. A meta-analysis of 47 demographic and health surveys showed that between 10 to 25% of women in Africa experienced infertility. This is about almost 200 million. And yet, it's interesting that the onus of infertility is placed on the woman despite medical evidence. For many, childlessness is a tragedy, resulting in a sense of failure, loss, stigma, exclusion, and often divorce. Oftentimes, there is an ethical, psychological, or even criminal physical violence, nicknamed domestic violence. I wonder who's domestic about it. For most, where childless is real, the chances of being in a stable relationship is reduced. The social and financial status of the woman is threatened and at times her very life. And yet, there are medical interventions. 
85 to 90% of the infertile can be treated by conventional methods of medicine and surgery. 3% can be treated using IVF. So, is infertility a state of ill health? Then, why is it covered by insurance? In respect to infertility treatment, is there equity in access to care? Who holds the infertility health provider accountable? Are there laws or regulations, or should we expect the professional boards to self-regulate and ensure ethical standards are upheld? Who regulates the number of times one can donate eggs or sperm? What is or should be contained in the contract for surrogacy? How much should it cost? What happens to the gametes or the embryos that are no longer needed or are abandoned by the owners? Should they be just poured down the drain? Should they be donated to childless couples? or should they be given up for research? And then I wonder, have I really heard of advocacy or lobby groups for inclusion of infertility treatment? Maybe not. Who really wants to accept that they are less than a woman because they are infertile, or they are not real men because they are infertile? Who should be held accountable to ensure that reproductive services for the infertility are not commercialized, or the human gametes and embryos commodified. The question is, can a poor stigmatized woman become a mother without financial distress of mortgaging her all? Are childless included in universal health coverage, or are they marginalized? and being left behind. To end, I want to read a verse for you. Come, baby, come. I always knew I wanted a baby. The maternal instinct was heavy. From a little girl cradling dolls, I heard all the motherhood calls of day, come, baby, come. An adolescent with hormones high looked forward to the marriage tie for this would be key to door to motherhood of babies for response to call, come, baby, come. One, five, ten years down the road, with Prince Charming in the fold, tried, tried, and still tried again, but waited baby arrival in vain. Loudly cried, come, baby, come. It's the hormones, it's the timing. Is it me or the Prince Charming? The fault is in one, in both, in none of us. Often wondered, is it a curse? For there was no answer to come, baby, come. Get another wife, divorce her, he was told. Please understand, she's now old. What? It's not a matter of fatherhood. Please hear me. It's motherhood. My call, not his. Come, baby, come. AI is for cows, I thought. Surrogacy considered and career sought. IVF, the only and last chance, they said. In vain life savings, the money was paid. Please, please, I begged. Come, baby, come. At last, married a wife of my very own. Modern medicine, only money blown. As female husband with wives lively brood, I thank God for traditions crude. At last, my answer I got, come, baby, come. Looking back years down the road, wondered why the years in the cold made me feel less than a woman to accomplish what is only human. The instinct to hear answer, come, baby, come. And now, I hear there's UHC. Wonder why it took so long to see. It's not ethical to leave the childless behind. 
It's financial distress of this kind used to say, come, baby, come. Wow, one further round of applause for Professor. Thank you so much, Professor, for sharing and giving us insight into your research and work. Infertility for African women is something that's almost always overlooked when we're talking about family planning. So thank you, thank you. Our morning plenary today will focus on financing universal health coverage in Africa. And we're starting off the morning with a fireside chat. And we have just the ladies to help us tackle this big topic. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Angela Nyambura Gichaga, uh, who will, OK. And also Madame Yasin Sambediouf. Uh, Dr. Angela is the CEO of Financing Alliance for Health, uh, a clinician and health economist by training. Uh, she is responsible for strategic development and fundraising, among other responsibilities at her organization. Yasin, Madame Yasin Diouf, uh, she is the program manager in the Cooperation and External Funding Department of the Senegalese Ministry of Economy and Finance. She is in charge of funders, technical and financial partners, and has had experience previously in budget preparation for Senegal. So ladies, it's up to you to help us have a good view of what we're talking about today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Wonderful. Ooh, that's loud. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Uh, honorable ministers, members of parliament, head of institutions and delegations and departments, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. It's our honor to be here before you today to start unpacking this very interesting topic around financing for universal health coverage. It's not often uh, that we have representation from Ministry of Finance in an international health conference. So we are very uh, grateful uh, for your time today, Madame Yassine, uh, to help us understand from a Ministry of Finance perspective, uh, what are the considerations that are taken into account when we are thinking about financing universal health coverage. Given the limited time, I will jump straight right into it. Every year, significant finances are pumped into health. Uh, and we hear often that, you know, even for the money we have, we could get more health for whatever is still in the pot right now. In your view, Madam, what are the opportunities to improve resource utilization in health programs? Welcome. Bonjour à tous. Donc euh, moi, je vais euh, répondre en français. Euh, avec la, la traduction, ça devrait aller. Je, je remercie Madame Tizaka pour euh, l'invitation. Je suis honorée euh, de participer à cette plénière. J'en profite pour euh, remercier le ministère de la Santé du euh, Rwanda, Amref, et également tous les partenaires qui ont euh, permis euh, l'organisation de cette importante conférence. Vous parlez des opportunités euh, par rapport à l'utilisation des ressources. Il faut, Il faut savoir qu'au Sénégal, son, excell... son Excellence Monsieur le Président de la République Macky Sall, à travers son... sa politique de développement économique et euh, social, le plan Sénégal émergent, a fait un bond en avant une, euh, par rapport à l'utilisation à des ressources euh, publiques. Il a, il a, dès le début de son mandat, de son mandat euh, exprimé son ambition de vouloir répondre à l'attente des populations par rapport à, à une meilleure visibilité, une meilleure traçabilité et plus d'efficacité dans la gestion des deniers publics. Donc, euh, la santé n'échappe pas à cette politique-là. 
euh, c'est une politique qui est basée sur la gestion axée sur les résultats. La, euh, tout, euh, tout le budget qui est accordé au ministère et à travers une matrice sectorielle euh, suivie pour avoir plus de traçabilité et de ce, de ce, de ce fait, à travers des indicateurs bien, bien spécifiques, nous pouvons savoir là où euh, les activités, c'est-à-dire les, les projets élaborés par le ministère, comment ils sont euh, financés et à quel résultat, euh, quel résultat ils donnent et comment le, la communauté peut en bénéficier. Donc c'est une, une question qui a été prise en charge dès le début à travers euh, le plan Sénégal émergent. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, and you're right, it would be great to realize some of the resource efficiency gains that you can get. But let's be honest, given the magnitude of need, cost savings will not meet those needs that we have financially in universal health coverage. If everyone deserves access to quality basic health care, as a Ministry of Finance representative, how can the health sector strengthen the case for domestic resource mobilization and securing a budget line? If you had two options in front of you, you had health, education, maybe infrastructure, what would go into the decision making on which one you would choose to allocate funds? Thank you. Merci pour cette question. On est conscient du fait que la couverture maladie universelle permet aux plus démunis, démunis comme nous le savons tous, d'accéder aux soins de qualité. Effectivement, tout le monde, je, bien, je dis bien tout le monde, a droit à une prise, une prise en charge et des, euh, et des soins de qualité. C'est pour cela que le président, son excellence le président Macky Sall, a mis le volet social au premier plan. Avec, euh, dans la deuxième phase euh, du PAP, euh, du PSE, c'est-à-dire le plan d'action prioritaire du PSE. C'est à, à travers euh, la création de l'agence de la CEMU, la couverture de maladies universelles, qui assure la mise en œuvre de la stratégie nationale de développement de la couverture de maladies universelles. Et, et euh, à travers cette agence, à travers la CEMU même, on a eu, dès le début, la gratuité pour les enfants de 0 à 5 ans, pour les seniors, et également la gratuité pour la césarienne. Donc, les, les couches de population les plus vulnérables, c'est-à-dire les jeunes enfants, les seniors et les femmes, ont été prises en charge. Par contre, comme on le sait, tout le travail ne peut pas être fait en une seule fois. On est bien conscient du fait que toute la, la tranche d'âge de la population a droit à la gratuité, a droit à la santé, a droit à, a droit à, à la prise en charge euh, au niveau sanitaire. Mais euh, cela va prendre du temps et je pense que euh, la patience est de rigueur. C'est bien parti, on a pris en charge les jeunes, nous avons pris en charge les femmes pour les, la césarienne, nous avons pris en charge les seniors, nous prendrons en charge avec euh, le temps, avec la politique euh, qui est mise en œuvre euh, de petit à petit. En effet, le budget de la santé au Sénégal a, je ne vais pas dire augmenté, c'est un, bon, un bon. On est passé en 2011 d'un budget de, 60, euh, de 95 milliards en 2011 à 169 milliards de francs CFA en 2018. Cela mérite des applaudissements, je pense. C'est euh, pour dire, en effet, tous les efforts qui ont, qui ont été consentis par le président euh, euh, par rapport à, à la santé. Nous sommes conscients qu'il faut que la population soit en bonne santé. Donc, cette politique-là, elle est vraiment mise en œuvre. Je vais vous donner juste quelques chiffres. Euh, en 2000, entre 2017, 2017 et 2018, nous avons eu une augmentation du budget de la santé de 6 milliards de francs CFA. Et entre 2018 et 2019, nous avons eu une augmentation du budget de la santé de 29 milliards. Vous voyez le gap qu'il y a eu entre les deux. Donc, euh, en 2019, nous avons un budget de la santé qui s'élève à 198 milliards de francs CFA. Donc, euh, je pense que ces, ces chiffres-là sont la preuve que la, la santé, quand même, est euh, prise en charge par, euh, par, de, par la politique. 
Donc, euh, en, grosso modo, nous sommes à peu près à 9,4% de, de hausse en moyenne annuelle du budget de la santé et nous nous approchons du 15% qui a été fixé par les États de l'UEMOA euh, à la conférence en 2001. Donc, euh, on est sur la bonne voie et je pense que d'ici quelques années, nous pourrons, toutes les tra tranches d'âge pourront bénéficier de, de la santé gratuitement. Les priorités. Bon, vous avez parlé des priorités par rapport aux infrastructures, par rapport à la santé. Il faut, moi, j'ai euh, un avis personnel là-dessus. Il faut savoir que on est dans un pays en voie de développement. On ne peut pas se permettre de dire on va développer la santé, on va mettre de l'argent dans la santé, on va laisser en, en, en amont euh, la, les infrastructures. Parce que le citoyen lambda qui est au fond, fond de la Casamance, qui est dans une zone éloignée, enclavée, il lui faut de l'infrastructure. Donc pour qu'il ait de, de la santé de qualité, il faut aussi mettre en corrélation, en parallèle, la, 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 les infrastructures. Donc on ne va pas dire qu'on privilège un secteur par rapport à un autre. Je pense qu'on travaille pour aller de pair ensemble. On ne peut pas juste tout focaliser sur la santé, euh, pensant qu'on peut, qu peut y arriver. On a des zones qui sont enclavées. Il faut aussi, en, en parallèle, mettre du budget dans l'éducation nationale. On a pas mal de d'élèves qui sont en malnutrition. Donc, avec la santé aussi, on crée des cantines scolaires où les, en, les enfants peuvent manger à l'école et on, on règle le problème de la malnutrition à l'école comme ça. Donc, euh, je pense qu'on n'est pas euh, au niveau où on va dire non, on a mis plus d'argent dans l'infrastructure. Si on doit mettre de l'argent dans l'infrastructure, on le mettra parce qu'on en aura besoin pour aller dans des coins reculés, pour, voir, pour aider le paysan qui est dans son, dans son village, pour aider l'ensemble des Sénégalais. Donc, euh, pour cette politique-là, voilà, je, pour cette réponse, c'est ce que je voulais vraiment dire de façon personnelle. D'accord, je comprends. Et maintenant, je vais summariser à la fin des importants points, mais c'est vrai, le développement est multisectoral. Uh, and the uh, Ministry of Finance has limited resources, uh, though health um, facilitates all other sectors. <clears throat> we consistently hear about uh, existing silos uh, within uh, governments and also between governments and non-state players. Um, Madam, as uh, Ministry of Health officials, as health partners, how can we better and more in effectively engage ministries of finance? Merci pour cette question. Elle m'intéresse parce que je suis au niveau de la direction de la coopération économique et financière. Je travaille beaucoup avec les partenaires techniques et financiers. Et je pense qu'il faudrait qu'on aille vers plus vers l'appui budgétaire. Il faudrait qu'on qu qu rompe un peu avec le système de, de projets où on finance des projets de façon individuelle ou de façon séparée. Nous avons une politique économique et euh, sociale qui est très bien élaborée, qui est très bien faite, qui est le plan Sénégal émergent. Donc les bailleurs doivent nous accompagner à travers un appui budgétaire, soit général, soit sectoriel. Le bailleur peut choisir d'aider dans la santé, donc l'appui budgétaire peut être sectoriel. Il est directement injecté au niveau du, euh, de, du budget de l'État à travers le trésor et il y a une traçabilité qui peut se faire à, euh, avec, des, euh, avec, avec le, le cadre d'évaluation. Le, le bailleur peut... Euh, créer un cadre d'évaluation, il pourra suivre son argent, voir où, là où l'argent rentre et, vous, et, et, et pouvoir tracer euh, son, son, ses financements. Mais je pense qu'il faudrait qu'on aille de plus en plus vers ce type d'aide-là plutôt que vers un type d'aide euh, où euh, on est juste concentré sur l'utilisation des fonds au lieu de se concentrer sur euh, les résultats d'ensemble. Donc il faut vraiment qu'on soit plus accompagné que nos politiques soient plus accompagnées qu'individualiser un peu les projets et les activités. C'est une, une des solutions vraiment qui pourrait aider énormément le ministère des Finances à aider le, 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 le président dans sa stratégie nationale pour 2035. Merci. Merci beaucoup. 
Um, I see we're running out of time, and I'd like to bring this uh, fireside chat to a close. I'd like to use the remaining minutes to just summarize the key points that have come through um, in this uh, conversation. Um, you've heard it from our, our colleague uh, uh, here who holds the, the government pass strings uh, of uh, the government of Senegal, and it's actually consistent with what we hear with ministries of finance across uh, the countries that we support in Africa and the Caribbean. The key takeaways uh, from what I have heard, and I'm sure you've also been taking, taking notes, um, high-level political commitment is necessary uh, to focus financing on universal health coverage. But it's not uh, sufficient um, to factor uh, domestic resource mobilization. Um, Ministry of Finance is the critical translator of political will to political action. So when you're having your conversations as health people, leaving finance out is uh, to your own uh, detriment. Um, the second is uh, realistic financing requests to be tabled to finance. You know, she said they do have multiple priorities and they are developing the country and not just one sector. So as you're asking for your billions, uh, be able to make the case but also recognize that other sectors are prioritized. Um, Given the conflicting priorities, we should allow time for gradual increases in budgetary allocation. So breaking down your billions of requested money into gradual incremental uh, budgetary allocations within the, the government budget. Um, we must also demonstrate results and impact for the monies already allocated. I think that is uh, very key and she brought that up. Development partners should align funding to, to government priority programs and not just their vertical projects of interest. And she's mentioned about wider um, support. And then um, Ministry of Finance actually should be seen as a technical advisor uh, in achieving a universal health coverage, not just a number cruncher and an Excel uh, expert. Uh, you'd be shocked about the, the actual uh, vast knowledge and experience that our colleagues have. I look forward to an insightful action enforcing discussion in the upcoming panel. Thank you, Madam Yassin, uh, for sharing your experiences. And to the ed audience, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, the conversation continues. Merci beaucoup, Asante Sana. Abrigado, Madam. Merci à vous. Merci à vous également. <laughs>
UAC is getting traction these days, and I think that traction is long overdue. Because many countries recognize the importance of investing in healthcare. And it is the fact that countries that have invested in healthcare are seeing good returns on what they've done. But to do this adequately, we need to be sustainable in the way we finance healthcare in order to make sure that we get this traction going and going and improving. About 20 years ago, countries of Africa agreed to set aside about 15% of the annual budgets on healthcare, but only a few have achieved that so far, and that was in the Abuja Declaration. But still, in recent times, we see a renewed interest, and that is very refreshing. Countries are trying to change the ways in which they raise financing for healthcare. At the same time, they are trying to you know, get more domestic financing into healthcare, but also they are trying to be a lot more efficient in channeling monies to where they are most needed. And for this, this distinguished panel is going to help us understand what have been the experiences so far, what are the promises, and where we're going. With me here we have Dr. Solange Hakiba. Dr. Solange is the Deputy Director of Rwanda's uh, Social Security Board. She's been very successful in helping the Urandan um, uh, movement towards UHC and also has ha worn a hat of being uh, a Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Health of Rwanda. Welcome Dr. Solange. Next to her, we have Dr. Marike Winrocks, who is the Chief of Staff of the Global Fund and has also served as its Interim Executive Director. She's a medical doctor and has worked for over 30 years in the public health space, serving in government multilateral organizations and also civil society. Welcome. We have next to her Honorable Dr. Robert Kugnab Lem, He's from Ghana, where I am from, and honorable welcome. He is a member of parliament in Ghana, has been a lecturer teaching health economics, policy and communications in Ghana, and he's an advocate for UHC in Ghana, and on the continent has, has spearheaded the UHC movement in Ghana. Uh, today, his pet subject is how to spread and expand primary health care in Ghana, and for that, he has a lot to share. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Next to him is an old friend, Monique. Uh, Monique Dolphin Vogelsang. Uh, Monique is the CEO of Farm Access. And many times when you talk about Farm Access, people ask whether they supply medicines, but they don't. Farm Access is an entrepreneurial organization dedicated to connecting more people to better healthcare in Africa through technology and financing. Welcome, Monique. And last but not the least, we have John, John Kinuthia. John is a lead research analyst at the International Budget Partnership in Kenya. He's worked extensively in Kenya's public financing system. Uh, he will help us understand the importance of public engagement in the budgeting process. So welcome to all of you. I think it's much better to take my seat at this time. So I'll be closer to my panelists. So Dr. Solange, Rwanda has successfully implemented universal health insurance to eliminate catastrophic health costs for the population to achieve health for all. Can you share your experiences about this journey? Can we have somebody assist there with, uh, yeah, this, the switch is on there. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the, the, experience, the experience of Rwanda has been a um, long journey. From um, 1994, uh, genocide against the Tutsi and the devastation of the entire infrastructure, um, 
a big solidarity spirit and um, Agachiro movement, uh, meaning um, we are in charge of our own um, health and development and future, has grown into the population of Rwanda and has made everything easier in setting up that uh, uh, community-based health insurance scheme alongside the other uh, strategies that the government have put in place to um, tackle the issues, development, develop, development issues, health issues, uh, education issues, and uh, overall um, uh, country uh, interests uh, strategies. So when the community-based health insurance was set up, uh, the response was uh, very uh, big, but the mindset was still to be changed in a very uh, drastic way. And we had to put in a lot of education. And of course, uh, education uh, is one part, but we needed to create the confidence of the population into the services. So it has been um, work that has come from a multi-sectoral approach of uh, getting the population to be confident about the services, to access services uh, geographically, uh, clinically, but also to uh, renew the, 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 the uh, um, membership the following year, because every year it's a test. Did we do good enough last year that people have uh, uh, wants to come back the following year? So one of the biggest uh, um, tool we had was definitely the political will. And the head of state, the uh, rallying all the stakeholders in development for our country behind one same goal of getting people ready and fit to be uh, development actors. Thanks, Dr. Solange. Um, Honorable Lem, I do know that in Ghana, there's one thing that all politicians are united on, and it's about healthcare. Um, I personally had the experience of dealing with Ghana's parliament when I was chief executive of the health insurance, and the consensus was outstanding. How has that happened? Is it going to continue? What can other countries learn from that? Generally, all governments are focused when it comes to delivering health to the people. And so for all political parties, the commitment is there. The political will is there. But for me, what is more critical is that health plans, national health plans, must outlive governments. We I give you the case of Ghana, where we have uh, basically a two uh, political party state, pa uh, power changes hands from one party to the other. Each party that comes to power has its own plan. I would want to see the ministries of health asserting themselves and leading the process for political parties to follow. What, what I mean by that is each party has its uh, uh, manifesto, which it should implement. But who drives this manifesto? Who puts the meat? It should be the Ministry of Health. If the ministries allow political parties to do their own thing, then the consistent investment we want to see in health and its growth will be impeded. I, I give you an example again from Ghana where in the last government, it was the, the decision of the last government to build, each district assembly will build this, uh, cheap compounds, two, every year. This has been abandoned because it is not woven into a national health plan. How do we ensure that this concept, which is good, that is the bedrock for delivering uh, primary health care, that the cheap compounds which we pioneered in Ghana, that we sustain this and it grows. And so for me, yes, there's a will, the political will is there. Every state is interested in the health of its people, we will do what it takes, but the how is the question. In this regard, I will repeat that the ministries of health 
are allowing political parties or governments to dictate how infrastructure, how investments in health should be done, and that is not good enough. Technocrats must assert themselves and lead the process. I'll give you another example where uh, we had to debate seriously in Parliament whether we needed drones to deliver medical products and uh, uh, blood and blood products. And at the end of the day, it was a headache debate. I think we had to come to Rwanda here uh, to see how the system is working. Now, some people who oppose, including me, this idea was because of the fact that we didn't see the Ministry of Health driving this, but it was being driven by politicians who at the end of the day may not be, who at the end of the day are not the end users of drones, and who do not know the infrastructures at the uh, district levels, the rural level, whether they have the capacity to use blood and blood products uh, delivered by drones. Now, the hectic debate that went in would have been unnecessary if it is the ministry that generated this idea of drone, de drones delivering blood and blood products. And so, for me, less, we have nations who invest in health, but who drives this, who sustains this, who ensures that there is consistency. Governments in the West African sub-regions, uh, I think the maximum you may last as a government, a particular government, maybe two terms of five years or four years, so you have eight or ten, or, or ten years, but national health plans must outlive governments. Thanks. So he says we don't have to allow the politicians to drive it. <laughs> John, well, coming back to something related, and this time I'm actually going to talk about how we formulate budgets and how budgets could better reflect the aspiration of you know, driving towards UHC. In your experience, I know you've done a lot of work about uh, budgeting in, in Kenya and how government expenditures and you know, incomes are generated and spent. How can the public be involved? How can you take the aspirations of, of the public and let them become action points in budget framing? Um, so thanks, thanks for that, Nathaniel. I think public participation is a big buzzword in Africa. Uh, I think in Kenya, if I asked in this room right now, how many of us have heard of we need to have more public participation or have turned up in one public participation in their countries around the budget? Okay, so the hands are going up gradually, more on this side. Um, I think if you look at what has happened in Africa for, for, for a bit of time, is that there's a lot of decentralization that has happened. And the decentralization has really been driven by the belief that, you know, decisions made close at where people are and resources, you know, distributed based on the priorities that the public uh, picks, uh, then the budgets will be more effective. Uh, if you look at the health sector, for example, in the country where I come from, Kenya, um, about over 90% of health facilities are what we call level two or level three health facilities. So the dispensaries and the health centers, which are the first point of call for many people, uh, especially in the rural areas, but also in urban areas, which means that the public we want to engage with improving the facilities and improving the services that are provided at that level are the people who probably are not in this room today. So it's a question of how do we make it effective. And I think the reason why I say public participation is a buzzword is because it's spoken a lot you know, in, in different spaces, but how it's actually carried out is what has created a bit of controversy and apathy in many, uh, in many African countries. What are we getting right and what are we getting wrong? Number one, I think it's important to think that if you're inviting or if you want the public to effectively contribute to a discussion around the budget, then you need to make sure that they have the right information to engage. And I think budget transparency and issues of what information is available so that we are all having the same discussion 
Uh, so it's not that the government officials in the room have the information and the public does not have the information. So thinking of how transparent budgets are then means that we can start tweaking away to see how we can bring in the public more effectively. Because at the end of the day, budgets are about priorities. So what priorities are we discussing? What is the justification for picking one priority and dropping the other? That then can help the public have a more um, a, a more, uh, I think, effective discussions and in a way that then what they say, you know, directly lines up with the decisions that are being made at different uh, times in the budget. But at the same time, we should think a bit more closely, and this is something we've seen with our experience in Kenya, we should think a bit more closely on how we build the capacity of the public uh, when it comes to reading and understanding budgets. I think many a times, uh, you know, we look at our public finance laws and they will say they should be civic education, but nobody ever thinks about what that civic education should look like. Um, and we've seen, you know, that number one, there's a big myth that is thrown around by the likes of me, those of us who work in the budget world, where in a way we've kind of framed that budgets are very technical things, that is just a subject that should be dealt by a certain cadre of people and everybody else is just a passenger in that bus. That myth is very wrong. And I want us to throw it completely away in the deepest sea we can find. Uh, we've seen experiences in Kenya where people, even who cannot speak the official languages we have in the country, when you structure the training that you're doing with them, when you structure a consistent um, way to build their capacity, then they are able to come to the table and prepare well in advance to come and engage with the budget process. In some of the counties that we work in, we've seen, for example, there's one called Baringo, where we've seen the public uh, in that county push for an increment in the water sector. Baringo is one of the very arid counties in Kenya. But for three years, the community uh, in, those, in that county has been able to push uh, the, gov the county, the sub-national government uh, in Kenya to allocate more resources to water. And that community has engaged the budget process quite comfortably. And so we need to think very carefully about how do we build the capacity of, um, of members of the public to engage with the process. And that comes with one fundamental block. The fundamental block is we need to clearly understand what the budget cycle score looks like, what decisions are being made at what times, and what information should be available to the public at those times to engage. So in tweaking certain aspects of public participation, then we kind of get to move away from what is considered public participation today in many African countries, where is government officials come sit at the front, they give information to the public for one hour, 30 minutes, then the public has 30 minutes to ask questions, and then they leave and the decision has to be made in a boardroom somewhere. So we have to think of how to structure the discussions in the room in a way that, number one, it's a deliberation, not a lecture and answer and question session. Uh, and at the same time, we try as much as possible to make the decisions also in the rooms because the priorities that we are discussing have to be owned by the public. So I think these are some of the aspects that we have to think about uh, because UHC is going to be something that is of interest uh, in, as many countries pick up the discussion. It's going to be of interest to many uh, community groups that are you know, at much lower levels where the uh, primary health care is provided. So how do we make sure that the decisions are owned by the people at those levels? Thank you. Thanks, John. Those are really deep insights. And I, I expect that um, at the next uh, hike, if the same question is asked, who is involved in the budget process, I think I'm going to see every hand up. <laughs> now, with, with that, we move on to, to Monique. Monique, you have been involved you know, in finding innovative ways of, of investing in health and also deploying technology to advance access to health, especially on the African continent. Um, what has been your experience? What has the journey been like? Can you share that with us? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Nat. So I think first to, to get back to, to our name, because it is uh, indeed Farm Access. Uh, originally, when we started, it was because our founder, Yub Lange, um, uh, started to provide access to treatment uh, for HIV AIDS uh, at the end of 90s, early 2000s, when that was not pot possible for lots of different reasons, money, technical, uh, medical, uh, and also political will. 
Um, so he started Pharmexis and we started treatment programs which were being paid for by lots of multinationals. And the interesting thing is what happened and that is what set us out on uh, a certain pathway which we still are on today is that once the Global Fund and the PEPFAR were started, which were huge, important, breaking through initiatives, the fascinating thing happened is that all the private money that was being paid was crowded out. The multinational said, it's free, so we don't have to, have to pay anymore. So that was a classic way of where you see that public money comes available, but the private money is crowded out. So in our thinking, you need both, but how do you do this? It's complicated because indeed we've, we've heard a lot of um, uh, things over the past day and more to hear about um, uh, how we have to achieve UHC. Uh, we have to work holistic both on the supply and the demand side. Uh, uh, African governments are, are really trying to achieve the 15% Abuja uh, commitment. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's already a lot of money in the system. Of course, all the out-of-pockets. Uh, there's lots of donor, multinational uh, um, money, but it's all totally fragmented. Very fragmented, very siloed, and everything has its own controls. And most importantly, a lot of it is postpaid and not prepaid, so it's postpaid, so which is very inefficient. And, um, uh, and it's very fragmented. So in our thought, it is how can you work to combine that? So we've always worked to see on how we can work towards improving quality so that people get to trust the system. So when they know that they go to a hospital, that there is medication, there's doctors available, and how can we get investments going also in the supply side? Because uh, probably the private and the public combination is what is key to be able to en enable uh, UHC. Um, then there's another big thing that happened, and that is the mobile revolution, the digital revolution, the technology revolution, which is going on across the globe, but has uh, um, a really had also stunning effects uh, in, in Africa. And not just a mobile phone, but also mobile money, which has had a huge impact and, and, and way of including many people who were left unbanked and then suddenly uh, were able to, uh, to bank and to transfer money. So we started thinking about how can you do that. There's a huge opportunity to use the mobile technology to enable healthcare. And um, with the digital technology, it goes even beyond e-health, which is a very good solution for uh, uh, the shortage of uh, HR resources, but also very much it enables to much more flow money in a transparent, accountable way because you can reach individuals at almost no marginal cost. And I think that is the big game changer. And it's hugely democratizing and it's empowering for all of the individuals to be able to have uh, control and access to healthcare and themselves. So, and then on the, and in the investment side, to just close off, we, um, we have seen that investing in health, uh, uh, just to give you some, some figures, I just looked them up, the last one that I could find. Um, we, we've, we've seen all the numbers and how much investments are needed in health. And between 2002 and 2012, only 100 million was invested by the IFC and the World Bank in the private health. And uh, I know that's increasing, but it's still very low. Why? Uh, I think one of the things that was said here also, you know, in terms of policy and, 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 and stability of regulatory is very important for investors but also the trust that there is a role for the private sector and that is hugely important and that the quality is transparent and measurable. Um, we have been providing loans to private primary healthcare practitioners uh, in a number of countries uh, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. And the interesting things is where their banks think it's very risky to invest in a doctor or in a hospital. Uh, we have seen that we have been providing over two and a half thousand loans and the repayments rates have been at 96%. So nobody can tell me anymore that investing in health is risky because it's proven that it's a very valuable thing. And it's used to invest in expansion, in improvement of quality, uh, and no government funding is needed for that because the banks can do it. So let me pause there. Thanks, Monique.
In Ghana in 2001, uh, we were declared as a highly indebted poor country. And fast forward about eight years later, I woke up one morning and suddenly Ghana was a middle income country. <laughs> I don't know whether a development and improvement happens overnight, but it turned out that our GDP had been rebased and suddenly we were a wealthy country or wealthier than we were at least. And so this has brought with it some um, consequences. And Marika, you know that because of what is happening now, a lot of countries are transitioning out of the poverty bracket into you know, lower middle income status. It is meaning that um, some development assistance that these countries get are being scaled down. What is happening and how are you assisting these countries to cope with this new shock? Thank you very much. It's still not working. Eh? No. Go back to plan B. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nate. And uh, Global Fund was definitely not involved in rebasing uh, Ghana's uh, economy. <laughs> Um, but it, it happened to, to different countries. Um, just a few things on that. Uh, first of all, two weeks ago, WHO released a report on health financing, which I think was the first time that a very comprehensive database on health finance was published. Uh, the good news is that uh, the funding for health has increased quite dramatically. And external aid is increasingly a smaller part of the overall pie. So they looked at all WHO member states, including high-income countries. And of that overall pot, only 1% is coming from external aid, external support. So that um, really <clears throat> forces us to be very humble as external funders. But it was also very clear that where external aid was increasingly a smaller proportion of the overall health funding, for the low-income countries, this was not the case. And low-income countries are still largely dependent on uh, external funding for the health sector. And it's also in the low-income countries where the increases in domestic resources had been least, and where we saw replacement uh, uh, effects, uh, where donor support is replacing domestic resources. And uh, which is, so the fungibility is usually seen as a bad thing, but then just listen, listening to the speaker from Senegal, you do realize that development is multi-sectoral by definition. And it's, if you're in a resource-constrained environment, it's not really easy to say, well, let's uh, prioritize health or education or infrastructure or any other sector. So just recognizing that complexity. And as you say, Ned, in your introduction, as countries are moving, uh, up economically from low income to middle income status. Domestic resources are increasing, but at the same time, ex <clears throat> external support is decreasing. And in most cases, at a faster rate, then the domestic resources are increasing. So there's another poverty bracket that's entering. And for me, it's really important to see how as external funders you can support countries to get through that stage of economic growth without falling into that second poverty trap. So the Global Fund in 2016 adopted a policy on sustainability transition and co-financing. It's the first time they really started to systematically look at how we can support countries. And there's some key message in it. First of all, it's a long-term process. You cannot support countries towards sustainability and transition in a one or two year period. This takes at least six to nine years, if not longer. And, um, and even for countries who are in middle income status, it takes six to nine years. And also you have to be really strategic in how you then look at co-financing and the role of domestic resources. In the low income countries, it's very clear, we need more resources for health, not just for looking at the global fund, not just for HTB malaria, there should be more resource, resources for health. And as countries are moving up the income ladder, it's important to see what do countries need to uh, enable to transition successfully um, uh, from external funding. And it can mean more funding for, re, uh, for the health system, but it also can mean uh, more funding for, for example, legal frameworks, of more focus on legal frameworks that, uh, for example, allow countries to contract out services to private sector or civil society organizations, addressing legal uh, barriers to access to services, uh, programs for key populations that in many countries are almost exclusively externally funded. So you have to be very strategic on how you go through that stage. Uh, the Global Fund requires a co-financing from countries as a condition to leverage the full allocation. And I'm pleased to say that 
almost all countries deliver upon that commitment. And in a few exceptions are countries in crisis or countries without functioning government where we can waive the condition. Um, it's also clear that as we move uh, to support countries towards sustainability and transition, this should be an effort as led by countries. It's where it's going to fund us. Uh, we can support, we cannot lead. It's also clear that we have to work with the other health funders. We cannot, all health funders have our own specific targeted approach to uh, sustainability. We have to work together. Uh, you might have missed it, but in October, the Global Fund and 11 other multilateral organizations held signed a commitment to work better together uh, to support countries to accelerate progress towards the health-related SDG, the SDG3 Global Action Plan. And in the context of that plan, the Global Fund is working very intensely with the World Bank, Gavi, GFF, Global Finance Facility, and the WHO. Um, to see how we can work much better together on the health financing and, and domestic resource mobilization uh, agenda. And one of the issues we're working on is to have a much more coherent and consistent approach to domestic resource mobilization. Not the AIDS funders coming in and say you have to increase resources for HIV and Gavi coming in and say you have to increase resources for immunization. But take a much more comprehensive approach uh, with all of us together. It means that we have to increase the size of the overall pie. Um, the AU, in their recent summit, they uh, launched an effort to increase funding for health and domestic resources for health and ensure better spending of that health. And one of the data coming out of that summit was that if all uh, member states of the African Union, if they introduce effective and efficient systems for tax and revenue collection, we could generate an additional $200 billion a year uh, for the continent, which is an amazing amount of money that would help a great deal with sustainability. Um, there's also a number of countries in the region that have introduced recently sin taxes, uh, additional taxes on um, products that are not good for your health, like alcohol, cigarettes, um, uh, sugary products, that will make more funding available for health. And that's the other part. We, can, we have to increase the overall pie. We also have to see how we can increase the share going to social, uh, social development in the overall pie. Um, and, and as you said, Nate, in your introduction, health is not an expenditure, it's an investment. And, and just make that case, but then coherently and jointly. And uh, we obviously have to increase the efficiency of how health is, how funding is spent. Uh, look at value for money and efficiencies, but also look at how funding is targeted, whether it does uh, reach the people who are most in need, whether how is the, the, the balance in spending between the first, second and third year line of um, of, of care. So uh, we are already working together and, and trying to be more coordinated and comprehensive in a couple of countries, including a couple of countries in Africa. We have developed a joint training that we're now um, initially for internal staff, but also rolling out in regions, mostly in regions that are moving most uh, fastly towards transition, like uh, the Pacific, uh, Latin America, Eastern Europe, but also plan to have those joint courses, which is for the organization, but most importantly for the national stakeholders, so that we have a common narrative, a common understanding, talk a similar language, and can jointly work towards more sustainable funding. Thank you. Thanks so much. And, well, in, in, in Marika's submission, I picked uh, a repetition of a certain theme, and it was about efficiency. Efficiency in um, raising revenues, efficiency in spending, efficiency in putting these resources together. That's why I come to you, Honorable Lam. In, in Ghana, uh, when the National Health Insurance Scheme was introduced in 2003, uh, I was listening to the radio stations, and there was a, a VAT levy but the conversation was spent so well that it was no more a levy. It was an investment for your health care. And fast forward 2018, there was a mid-year budget review, and suddenly some aspects of the VAT were turned into a final tax, basically a sales tax without the public understanding and knowing. Tell me how these very good communications have been done, how uh, these innovations have been done, and why have the public been accommodating of them? The, <coughs> the innovations have brought in more money, and that is what uh, people who think that uh, the tax, even though it is a direct tax, 
has a burden on the people. But the fact that it will bring in more money for national health insurance was acceptable. However, the problem is that there's what we call capitation on it, which is 35%, and the money is being retained by the Ministry of Finance. What is happening is that about 70% of all uh, VAT, uh, VATed items, all the money comes into national health insurance. This amount of money is enough to pay for all healthcare costs in Ghana. But the money is not used for the purpose for which uh, you started it. Uh, the money is being used for other things, including giving scholarship for people to go and study. Now, we have created a very huge, monstrous bureaucracy. Say um, my, my community is about, say, a thousand miles from the capital. I don't have a district hospital. I have a, a, a health center. The health center may owe, I mean, government may owe the health center, or the scheme may owe the health center, say, 5,000, uh, uh, not 5,000, uh, $500. Hospitals in the city may owe up to $500,000. Uh, they all come to Accra to queue to be paid. What sense does this make? People in the rural area just want treatment for malaria, pneumonia, and, and things like that. And you owe that this small clinic an amount of, say, $500. Uh, and yes, you with somebody who, was, uh, me, who you have to pay $500,000. And so it is, we are generating a lot of money. And apart from this, uh, the, the, the VAT, we also get money from uh, pensions. Uh, anybody who is on a payroll contributes to uh, uh, the, the health insurance levy. And this is about 14% of all pension payments go into health insurance. The problem with Ghana health insurance is the bureaucracy. And that wasn't the original intention. We need to move the money to the regional levels, and the regional level would then move the money to the district level, and so that the time lapse in payments of debts is uh, significantly reduced. In my region, we, we have about uh, 12 districts. Each of these is supposed to have a district hospital, a health center, and you know, the, the primary health care uh, uh, structures. Now, why, why should they move 1,000 um, kilometers to the south to get their payments? And so for countries that are yet to implement national health insurance, the Ghana scheme is, is in terms of money, is very, very rich. But in terms of the utilization of this money to the common good for the purposes of achieving universal health coverage is, is, is a big problem. It's a very, very big problem. We need to move the money to where it is needed most. Thank you. And with that, I, I will come to Dr. Solange. I, I know you've been doing a lot of innovations in Rwanda. Um, you know, you've been trying to cross-subsidize and get the rich to pay for the poor uh, in order to expand coverage. But at the same time, the Rwandan system is also looking at how to use resources a lot more efficiently. Uh, tell us about what you're doing so far and what can we learn from it. Thank you very much. Um, resources are just as much as we can um, leverage from the uh, national budget. And our role is actually to see um, beyond what the government is actually allocating to the CBHI, how are we, first of all, uh, getting more source of funding to be able to finance our health, uh, um, community-based health insurance, but also uh, work on the cost containment, uh, be more efficient, and uh, uh, within the same uh, amount of money or being able to, leave, to deliver more or better. 
So we have been working across the different sectors. And uh, um, we are looking at the services we render and we see where are the people receiving their services? How are they achieving them? One of the key uh, supports uh, in delivering services is actually the role of the decentralized level. The local authorities, the mayors, are key in uh, supporting the access to care. So one of the things that uh, the mayors have been doing is actually increasing the point of services where the uh, people are able to access uh, service at the health post. And by building health posts through a uh, um, uh, public-private uh, uh, community initiative, we also work together to see what kind of services are being delivered at that level and how much is it costing us so that we try to deliver the entire package of the primary health care at the lowest level possible with an emphasis on the quality and see how we improve the referral level every time. Um, prioritization is also a key uh, tool in, in trying to finalize the service we're supposed to render within the budget. Uh, we look into what are the services we render, we measure them. Making, being able to measure what we do and uh, holding each and every, one, every stakeholder accountable on their role and basically working on the risk sharing. There's nothing that, like being the sole risk bearer in, in a partnership. The population is, is the same, but we need to see how we, every one of us own that scheme because at the end of the day, this will be div um, delivering services to the entire population of the country. Currently, we are at a coverage of 85% of the entire country. And it's key because uh, people can access services everywhere. Mm -hmm. So by working on the different um, prioritization together, we sit together and we plan together. We look into the key issues of uh, the, the, the community. I liked very much what uh, Mr. John said earlier, the public participation in really planning everything we do and looking into the budget. What do we have and how much can we leverage more from what we have? So uh, in Rwanda, we will not only work with the budget of the Ministry of Health, we will work with the budget of the Ministry of Infrastructure. We will work with the Ministry of Local Government. So it's key that we sit around the same table and the uh, Imihigo or the contra uh, performance contract that the mayors sign with the president every year are key to make sure that uh, uh, the, the shortfalls of last year are not going to repeat themselves because we will pledge to attain certain goals and make sure that uh, we are able to uh, deliver services. So it's not only the, 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 the national budget. Mm -hmm. We look into the development partners. Uh, the coordination around that uh, uh, support is key also because uh, we work in a mutual accountability framework and goals are set ahead of the game so that we know exactly who is doing what, where, and how much are we supposed to be measuring at the end of the, 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 the partnership. Of course, I talked about the private sector. They are the newcomers in the, sec in, 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 in the game, but they are not the smallest because they come with funds, they come with knowledge, skills, but they come also with a mindset that is actually um, revigorating. I hope this is also a French, uh, an, an English word. Okay. <laughs> the private sector is bringing in a dimension that is very interesting and even very challenging for the public sector. And I, um, I think it's a very good way for us to, to change the way we do things. We have maybe sat into some kind of comfort and the private sector is saying, I need to be part of the game, I need to bring my own um, stone to the building, and this is how I'm going to do that. And we work together on the framework, we work together on the, on the, on the um, service to be delivered, level uh, the package of services, and, at some, and we start actually having an actual uh, discussion. We become real partners in this and we gain more strategic purchasing power because we every know, everybody knows what he's bringing on the table. So I think it's also, it's really um, a, a different uh, mindset. And uh, um, this is also very much supported by the national or, or the country uh, business environment. 
We need to be able to make the private sector confident enough to come and invest in the country. The drone example, it's making a huge change in, in blood delivery in our facilities. When we look into, for example, maternal death reduction, it has been key. It has not been the only uh, strategy, but for example, again, for public participation, the maternal death audits. When the people sit around uh, the issues that within their communities, they're able to draw uh, lessons from the um, uh, unfortunate examples or cases that have been happening in, the, in their community. And they decide, why did this mother die? Did, why didn't she get to the facility early enough? I think it would be preaching to the converted here, but it's still necessary to come back and sit with the actual beneficiaries of our services. What do you need? And then we talk about the budget we have behind those strategies, and we talk about how it will be delivered and the accountability process. Um, I enjoyed very much the uh, honorable uh, uh, point about the manifesto. We talk about policy, uh, and a lot of about politics. But at the end of the day, I'm drawing from the example of Rwanda, the economic development and poverty reduction strategy, we need to all work against one document. We need to, to define which, um, which path are we going through, through or towards. So, which, we, we, what, are, what is the, 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 the success story we want to build? What are we trying to achieve all together? Then, regardless of which horizons one comes from, we all align in one key document. Because at the end of the day, we, again, same population, and we need to deliver all of us for the Thanks. same Thanks. Thank you so much. much. Well, in her delivery, she stressed the importance of private sector involvement. And Monique, uh, certainly being in this space of investing in UHC comes with its own risk. And I can see at least two risks. The first is, you know, political. Uh, what happens when there are changes in government or changes in policy? What happens to your investment? Number two, uh, what about unstable economic environments? And how do they imperil your investments? Are these things that bother you? Do you have sleepless nights about these? Yeah, thank you. I had a sleepless night about this panel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think these are very good, uh, good points. Um, uh, and I think, uh, and, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm glad to, to hear some of these things because indeed for investors, um, you know, a, a stable political and policy and regulatory environment is key. Because if that is not there, you, are not, you do not know if whatever you invest, you will get it back, at what terms. So these are crucial. And um, uh, the complementarity of uh, having private sector investments to the government efforts are very much needed in a PPP, in a collaborative way, to be able to achieve UHC. Uh, there's been long debates about the role of the private sector, uh, and we've seen changes in that, and, uh, and uh, uh, I sincerely applaud those, because uh, there, should be, uh, there is a great opportunity there. And uh, indeed, uh, governments can uh, set the legal framework and, and regulate and set the policy within uh, they would like to see that happen. And indeed, in a manifesto, would give some predictability for investors to know that uh, uh, risks are reduced. So that is indeed uh, a very important uh, point. On the politics side, also there, I mean, we've seen a, a few years ago in countries where suddenly there's free maternity care and there's private facilities that had invested in expanding their maternity homes, uh, wards, and suddenly the patients were gone. Um, so these things then, of course, have an impact, uh, um, and it, it's, it's good to take those always in, uh, in account. And then I think uh, uh, that indeed the innovative side from the private sector, again, when well regulated and fitting within the policy framework of governments, have a huge potential. Um, M-Pesa, Uber, PayPal, it was all the private sector and it's all hugely enabling. Digitization, uh, 
really provides a huge opportunity to, uh, to even leapfrog many of the, of the problems. The financing uh, elements that you uh, spoke to uh, is, is really something uh, through technology it's able to repay facilities within 24 hours no matter where they are to process the claims and to do things with algorithms with data uh, so we are on the brink of really a big big change uh, that can be harnessed and can absolutely I think uh, uh, help um, achieve UHC um, in fact I think it's the only way by banking on that that we can achieve UHC because that is the way that we can do things different which were not possible until recently. So let me pause there. So John, you talked about decentralization and how it's changing the face of public budgeting. Um, now with that increasing shift towards decentralization, how can we get the right capacity to improve allocations to health, uh, how to ensure more efficiencies out of the spend or investment. I'm, I'm contradicting myself, <laughs> out of the investment. Um, I think, you know, and for those of us who are in this room, so domestic resource mobilization and the need to push more resources to health uh, also, you know, will mean that the priorities that we want to fund within health will have to happen and be channeled through our country's budgets. But when that money gets there, then you find scenarios where there is a decentralized system. And for example, in Kenya, a huge chunk of health services is now run at the sub-national level. So as we are discussing the priorities, it means that we have to focus on both levels of government. We have to focus at the national level where the Ministry of Health sits, but counties at the sub-national level are also working uh, <clears throat> on their own budgets. So, First is to appreciate that our budgeting systems are that complex in terms of how they have to work. And so getting the clarity of what functions are being run by what level of government and then getting clarity on what it costs so that those governments have a constant push from us on you need to allocate X amount of money because that's what you need to run the functions that are actually uh, given for you. So that is quite, uh, quite important. But I think the second aspect, which is why we decentralize, is the issue of dealing with marginalization and bringing the issues of equity into UHC. Uh, it is pretty clear that we won't get all the money that we need to implement UHC all in one go. So the question is how do we prioritize on who do we need to pick up first? Uh, and I think for, for, for many countries, the, you know, the, the, the discussion on budgets provide the best platform. So if you look at the program-based budgets that are done in our countries, and the last I checked, about 80% of African countries have what we call program-based budgets, is that in there you find very critical sections that have targets and indicators of what we are trying to achieve. And in setting those objectives, then the allocations that we give for funding health then are supposed to be based on what we are trying to achieve as a country and also as sub-national units. But in there also lies the opportunity to look at whether those objectives are addressing marginalization and equity issues. So as we think of the capacity that we have, it needs to directly respond to what do we have in our budgets right now. So, as I said at the beginning, reading budgets is pretty critical. Uh, understanding the different stages where different decisions are being made is quite important. And is also moving our attention a little bit beyond just the formulation side of the budget. We all, and I'm sure this runs across Africa, we all love saying, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. So the formulation side of the budget has quite a lot of interest. But the implementation side also needs the same level of interest. As we know, you know, supplementary budgets and reallocations that happen within budgets have also become quite a challenge uh, because we allocate money to a budget line that is very important for immunization, for example. Then during uh, the, the supplementary side of the budget, that money is completely moved away. So it's also for us to appreciate that budgets are political documents. I think this is very important and uh, the Honorable Member from Ghana can speak to this, is that we need to understand that the Ministry of Health and the technical people we speak to at that level will understand what we are saying. We probably even come from the same side in terms of our arguments. But the people who approve the budgets at the end of the day, whether it's at the national level, whether it's at the sub-national level, are elected members of parliament, elected members of the local uh, 
of the local units within the sub-national level. So appreciating that and engaging throughout the budget process, there's no one right time. We don't have to wait for when our ministers turn up with briefcases to now turn up for the budget discussions. By the time those briefcases come out, a lot of decisions have already been made. So we need to engage throughout the process. The process is longer than one year. So as we are engaging with that, then and repeating it over time, then our understanding of where the gaps are, where the opportunities are, and how to engage better, then will improve over time. Thank you very much. At this time, we are going to turn it over to you, uh, the audience, and to ask you to field questions that might be burning in your minds and your hearts. I, I don't want to be seen to be discriminating in favor of the host of the conference. So, Dr. <laughs> Gitinji, I'll take you last. But I'll take the first question over there. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like one issue that didn't come out uh, very much in the panel is inequality. You talked about devolution in Kenya. We know that in Nigeria, a lot of the health funding goes to the state level and there's a lot of differences between how things are implemented in different states. So I was wondering if anyone can comment about the inequalities within countries because we talked about GNI and that doesn't reflect what people are actually able to pay for. Thank you. Um, any other hands? Well, yeah, there's a hand there in the brown jacket. That's if I'm not colorblind. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mine is a question and a comment. Question on how do we make the economic argument turn in favor of investing in health to show how that investment is a saving and not a cost, not a burden, but a saving. And how can we therefore turn the stories of Ethiopia into analyzing how much does it cost, the cost of funding a community health worker per month, how does that translate into saving lives, saving the burden in hospitals because people are not going so frequently, reducing the cost of drugs, how many drugs. So that economical talk is something that convinces policymakers and finance ministries. And I need to see that we have emphasis on that. So at least I have an eye lion in the room, investing in health. <laughs> Dr. Gitingi will take the question from you. <laughs> So I had to hijack the microphone before him. No, you'll speak. But I just wanted to find out from the member of parliament of Ghana, what then is the role of parliament? Because I heard you very clearly saying that uh, after the appropriation, monies are diverted. And I thought, and this seems to be a trend over the years, so what is Parliament's role? Are you trying to tell us that you're toothless? That you can do nothing about the situation? I thought you can hold the Minister of Finance accountable. You appropriated money for health care, but how then is the money diverted? I think, I just wanted to hear from you. What is your role in all this? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gitinji, I still want to hear from you. <laughs> Uh, my, it's a very quick question because I think uh, Marike talked about uh, sustainability in trans and transition and I have seen many countries struggle with transition from donor aid and how to integrate donor money into own budget uh, so that it goes on budget. But Rwanda has a very good kind of track record on trying to bring donor aid money or direct assistance to health onto budget. So I would like to hear from Solange and to the people here, how has Rwanda done it and what are the key two, three steps that government need to take to bring uh, donor money on budget. In Kenya, the estimate is that only about 23% is on budget. The rest of it, is 70 something percent, is off budget. If we are going to transition, the on budget conversation is important. So maybe some learning from Solange on what the Rwanda government has done. Thank you. Uh, th I'll take the final one and we'll have very quick responses. There's a person in blue over there. Uh, 
Um, I'm from Nigeria. Please be very brief. I yes. actually turned it over uh, to her. But we, we have um, a national health insurance scheme that is mostly focused on the formal sector. And yet, because of the nature of our communities, we believe that we would go much faster if we invested in community-based health insurance schemes. Yet, we've had very little results with the few pilots we have. I'd like the Rwandan team to tell us what you did to scale up your community-based schemes so rapidly. Thank you. So, I, I will oblige you, but it should be very short. Yeah, it's very short. Thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, on PPPs, I just want to know what the governments and private sectors are doing to ensure that the sort of partnerships uh, do not lead to too much privatization of healthcare, which you've experienced for quite a long time, and causing you no know, increasing reproducing so many inequalities. Thank you. Thanks so much. So I'll ask for very quick responses from the panel. Um, I would think that most people can answer these questions in a minute. Solange. Thank you very much. So uh, about the sustainability of the schemes or the uh, health sector uh, services and the transition or graduation from external support, I think uh, one of the key um, strategy was to actually have one uh, economic development and poverty reduction strategy in place that all the stakeholders in development worked on, indicators were set all together, uh, and then an m and &E framework was designed. And um, uh, of course, it, had, it, it came, uh, le let me say gradually, because even for a government to pull all the, gov uh, the, sub the external support into budget uh, support needs to have built that confidence that you will actually be delivering what you said you'll be delivering. So the m and &E and accountability framework was key to make sure that everybody is coming on board. Transparency, come with the, on, on the field with me and see what I've done with the money we agreed that you will mm. give, that, the money that you gave and the indicator that we set together. The government at the central level could not achieve that alone without putting in the district and the uh, uh, provinces. So that's the very reason why we have set the performance indicators. Not only, uh, like I have performance indicators in my uh, organization, but at a bigger uh, level, my organization has uh, uh, performance indicators with the Ministry of Finance, which we are um, um, under. And the Ministry of Finance has performance indicators, just like the other uh, ministries. But the districts, also sign what we call imihigo, which, which translates into pledge. You pledge to the government that you will be uh, achieving this much at the end of the year. And you are accountable for that. You have a team that has worked on that. The mayor cannot come up with those strategies overnight on top of his head. You have worked with them. We also have what we call the joint action, um, uh, action plan that where the a development partner sits with the district members uh, or, or team and elaborate those action plans. So it is accountability at every level of our delivery system and of course at the, has, the highest level the president himself will pledge that every franc that is invested in health or in any other sector will be properly used and accounted for. So I think that's one of the key uh, uh, um, way to achieve it and create that confidence for budget support. Of course, graduation also will mean that we look at, into the different, uh, first of all, the time frame. How long are we, do we have to have graduated from external support to totally domestic funds? We need to see year one, what are we going to put into our domestic funds? And what is the role of the, of the, of the population that is benefiting from those services? Are they owning the system? That's why sensitization is key, to make sure that everybody knows what they've been benefiting for, where it came from. Free service is good for a while. You need to know that at some, uh, somewhere somebody is paying for it. So as much as you enjoy it, know that somebody's paying and tomorrow that person may not be able to pay. So that's why we say uh, everyone has to know exactly how much is being put into an activity or a strategy. 
Um, the question about how we were able to scale it, same story. It just sounds strange, but it's again uh, performance indicators and rolling all around the same subject. The informal sector is very big in Rwanda, and I assume it's also in uh, many countries. But when we look into who will be doing the sensitization, for, first of all, I think one of the, huge, the biggest tools we, we were able to put in place was socio-economic categorization of our population. Who is who? How many people do you have in your household? And how much are you supposed to pay for your premium in order to enter the, uh, the um, community-based health insurance? We could have started free. There, there are some services that are free because they're subsidized. But you need to uh, uh, know for those who are not free and for which you will be paying your community-based health insurance, how much are you going to pay? So the community sat together. Literally, the, the village will sit and say, household one and two and three, how wealthy are they? Who is the most vulnerable? And that will be the category one of our Ubudehe database. The Ubudehe database will say this one is vulnerable and cannot afford to pay the premium. Therefore, the government will subsidize with uh, some external uh, development partner support. Then who is category two and three? Do you have at least a meal per day? Do you, have, do you own your, uh, your house? Do you have a field where you can do some agriculture? All those criteria are being set and the village decides family A is very vulnerable, we all agree about that, two, three, and four are much better off, and they will be able to pay for their own premium. So by, by categorizing the entire population, uh, we were able to know how many people we have per household, and how much are we expecting to receive at the end of the premium collection. And then sensitization, that is not our role. The, com the, the local government will play the role of sensitizing, because they know the people, they live next to the people. Community health workers play a key role, because they deliver service, they, um, you, they make you more, uh, they increase the utilization rate of the services, and they also do all the sensitization around it. So again, uh, at the ministerial level, the social cluster, all the ministers who are in, in charge of uh, social, uh, who are players in the social sector, have to come together and address the issues. If it's GBV, if it's maternal health, if it's malnutrition, we need to sit together and say, how much do we have that we can put in this strategy in order to uh, remove the problem we have? Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. so much, Dr. Solange. I will move to you, Honorable Lem, and in very brief words, you were asked about how do you ensure accountability. Uh, can you tell us in one minute? Generally, the Ghana National Health Insurance, apart from its core tax of paying uh, providers, service providers, it also has other responsibilities, for example, training. And so it is a question or even buying vaccines in case of uh, situations where the central stores do not have enough vaccines and there's an outbreak. They, they use their money to buy vaccines. So it is, not, it is more of prioritization. For example, in instances where you would give uh, money uh, in terms of training, you give somebody money to go and do a PhD, it, it, how necessary is that? And so it is not a question of diverting resources, but it is prioritizing and making sure that the core tax of service payments to service providers is, is what you do. And so that's the point I, I, I wanted to make, but not divert. We okay. have a very robust Auditor General Department in, in Ghana, and there's no way that uh, you can divert public money. Thank you. So it's about prioritization. Uh, Monique, there was something about uh, the private sector. So briefly, would you share your, your views? Uh, Yes, well, if I, if I can, just on the, 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 the quality question, um, because I think that's indeed a, a, a very good remark. Quality is, of course, key to, to health care. Um, and I think there are just one or two quick thoughts. Um, quality is important because people need to trust the health care services that they access. And that is hugely important for the perception, but also from the trust perspective, and also for the willingness to, to prepay. Um, and also, I think that working towards UHC and like many countries are doing in some sort of a health insurance way, it allows to pay for outcomes instead of inputs. 
And I think that is a very important part to drive quality, because when you only pay for input, there's no incentive for quality. And uh, I think that would be a very, something very important in the design in any scheme. Thank you. Marika, there was something about fragmentation of funding. And in helping countries that are coming out of this transition, how do you help them to overcome this challenge? Very briefly. I think that is exactly the point that I tried to make on working together among the key health funders and the government leadership to see how you can have a comprehensive approach to domestic resource mobilization to health financing and prioritizing and not every single funder going for their own uh, topic. Wonderful. So at the end of this, I'm going to ask each panel member in two words or to put up two key words to say what should be the focus of our drive towards UHC in terms of how we raise funding. Uh, in an efficient way to, to support UAC achievement. Solange, two key words. Stakeholder uh, inclusion. Stakeholder inclusion. Well, um, maybe common narratives. Common narrative, Honorable Lem. The Ministry of Health asserting themselves and uh, uh, mobilizing resources for governors. I heard a sentence. <laughs> Mobile technology. Uh, for me, it's uh, open equitable budget. Wonderful. I think it's been a wonderful panel. Um, so what I heard and the key messages that we're taking away is that we have to look more inwardly to be able to secure you know, financing for UHC in Africa. Uh, donor funding is dwindling and the more uh, we averted our minds to getting more domestic resources, the better. I also hear that uh, even where donor funding is, is dwindling, there's still a room or a role for donor funding, and it must be channeled appropriately as Rwanda has done. I do hear that one of the best investments to make is to actually concentrate on primary services or primary care in order to ensure that a majority of our population get the services they need because this is a good way of spending our money. I also heard that we have to be very deliberate in the way we purchase healthcare services looking at the benefits package that is most appropriate, looking at the incentives that we give to people to be able to render those services and get in the right facilities and the providers to do so. I heard about mobile technology. I heard about the role of the private sector, that it's a risk taker in the UHC space. And I also heard that in everything that we do, we must be efficient, first of all, in mobilizing resources, in pooling them, and also in purchasing services. And finally, to say that what we hear is that countries are determined in their path towards UHC and that more and more there is commitment in raising the financing to do so and to use it more efficiently. I thank you very much for being a very good audience. Panel, thank you very much. Another round of applause for our panel. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nathaniel Otto, for uh, leading the panel. Indeed, we need to stop spending on healthcare and investing in universal healthcare. This marks the end of our plenary. I won't take too much of your break time, but I have a few announcements and reminders. Uh, PATH social accountability for universal healthcare session was moved to room MH2. So PATH social accountability for UHC session was moved to room MH, MH2. Also the workshop on writing good abstract for conferences was moved to room AD6. The workshop was moved to room AD6. Uh, during your break, please stop by the uh, booth to check out some of the sponsors of this amazing conference and their different programs, ideas, and innovation. And also remember we have an innovation marketplace where different innovators are sharing cutting edge technologies and ideas that can accelerate uh, progress towards universal healthcare in Africa. Thank you so much and see you this afternoon.